concentration is when particles move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. This movement is random and passive, requiring no energy. If I took some potassium permanganate crystals and placed them in water, over time the entire water would turn purple as the potassium permanganate diffuses through the water. Another example of diffusion can be seen when oxygen and carbon dioxide move into and out of the blood in our alveoli. Our second type of movement is osmosis, which is a type of diffusion involving water only. This is where water moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration through partially permeable membrane. Again, this movement is passive, requiring no energy. If you look at this diagram, how will the liquid move in the capillary tube? You would expect it to move up over time. The visking tubing is used in kidney dialysis machines as it acts as an artificial, partially permeable membrane and has microscopic holes in which it lets small molecules like water through, but larger molecules such as sucrose can't cross it. This would mean water moves from the beaker where it is in high concentration into the visking tube where it is in low concentration. Sometimes a red dye can be added to these experiments to make it easier to see the liquid move. Let's take a look at how osmosis can affect plants and animals. When a plant cell is placed in pure water, water is drawn into the cell causing the cytoplasm and the vacuole to push against the cell wall and the cell becomes turgid. This supports non-woody parts of the plant, such as young stems and leaves. It also holds the stem upright, so leaves can carry out photosynthesis properly. When placed in a concentrated solution, water is lost. The cell contents shrink and pull away from the cell wall. The cell becomes flaccid and causes plants to wilt, whereby the leaves will droop and collapse. This protective action is important for reducing water loss by reducing the exposed surface area of the leaf and closing the stomata. When placed in a highly concentrated solution, the cell loses more water and the cell undergoes plasmolysis. In animals, if red blood cells, for example, were placed in pure water, water will enter into these cells, causing them to swell and eventually burst. When red blood cells are placed in a concentrated solution, water will leave the cell causing it to shrivel and shrink. Osmosis is important in allowing water to move into the plants via the roots. Our third and final type of movement is active transport, which is the movement of particles from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration through a partially permeable membrane. Particles here move against the concentration gradient, so need energy from respiration. This diagram shows one mechanism for how active transport works. Carrier proteins in the cell membrane move substances from a low concentration to a high concentration. They use ATP to change shape to move substances against the concentration gradient. In humans, an example of where active transport occurs is in the small intestine where glucose in the gut will move into the cells lining the intestine by active transport. In plants, the roots use active transport to move mineral ions into them. Four important factors that affect the rate of movement are diffusion distance, concentration gradient, surface area to volume ratio, and temperature. The smaller the distance atoms need to move across, the faster the rate of movement. The alveoli in your lungs have walls that are one cell thick, which allows for oxygen and carbon dioxide to move quickly through them. The concentration gradient refers to the difference in concentration between two areas next to each other. The steeper the gradient, the greater the difference and the faster the movement. In this cell, the difference across the two areas is greater or steeper, so movement into the cell is faster. In this cell, the difference across the two areas is smaller, less deep, so movement into the cell is slower. The size of a cell surface or surface area defines how quickly they can absorb substances. The size of their volume determines how much of these substances they need. Single cell organisms have a large surface area to volume ratio compared to larger multicellular organisms. As the volume of the cell increases, the surface area does not increase at the same rate. So movement into these larger organisms is much slower. So the bigger you are, 
the slower the movement, multicellular organisms have a larger distance from the surface to the inside. This means that simple diffusion will not be sufficient to meet their needs, as it will take too long for things to move across them, which is why they have organ systems with adapted exchange surfaces. Let's go through how you can work out the surface area to volume ratio. If we look at this cube, it has a length of one centimeter. Step one, we would need to work out the total surface area. To do this, we start by working out the area of one side, which is one times one. We then would times this by six, as there are six sides of the cube. This gives us a total surface area of six centimeters squared. Step two, work out the volume, which is the length times the width times the height. This equals to one centimeter cubed. Step three, work out the surface area to volume. You can do this by dividing the surface area by the volume. This gives six. As a ratio, it would be six to one. Now what's important to remember here is that when an organism is small, movement across it is much more quicker than when the organism is big. Our fourth factor is temperature. As temperature increases, atoms gain more thermal energy, which causes them to vibrate faster, increasing their kinetic energy. As a result, the rate of movement also increases. Hi, my name is Mr. Science, aka Salim. If you're new to the channel, please remember to like and subscribe. And for more teaching and resources, you can visit my website at www.mrscience.co.uk. Oh, 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 oh,